All right, if you'll open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. It's funny how kids take and how they repeat things when Melinda was talking about the people didn't hit her over the head with the Bible. Savannah goes, some boy hit her over the head with the Bible. (laughs) Oh, I missed all that for 10 days. Mark chapter 10, we'll be looking at chapter, or verses 17 through 23. It's, uh, I would think it's a somewhat familiar story to all of us uh, about the rich young ruler. Uh, it's talked about in a couple of the Gospels, and, and people, I've used it as sermon illustrations to kind of as to kind of back up my points before, but uh, we'll get into it a little more in depth this morning. It says, And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him. And said unto him, One thing thou lackest. Go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. He was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked round about, and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for your gospel. And Lord, how it's not just contained to four books, but Lord, how it is contained in 66 books, how it's contained in ourselves, how it's contained in our witness, how it's contained in our life. And Lord, I pray that every one of us here lives that. Lord, that we take your word and we make it a part of us. Lord, that we study to show ourselves approved. Lord, that we, we study and we search the scriptures. And, and Lord, that, that we strive always to be closer to you. Lord, I pray this morning that uh, the words I speak are not my own, but Lord, that they're yours. Lord, that, uh, that I decrease and you increase. Lord, I pray for a, an anointing and a blessing, Lord, that that, that your word is what comes out of my mouth, and Lord, that your word is what the people hear. And Lord, I, just, I thank you and praise you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. All right, so, like I said, we, we know this story. Uh, we're familiar with it, the rich young ruler. The Gospel of Mark doesn't call him a ruler, but Luke does. So this man had power. This man had some authority. And so we, we see at the first of the scripture, you know, Jesus was going about doing what Jesus did. He taught, he healed, and, and done all these things, and this man come running up to him. And it was, it was, he was eager to, and you know, we see that in the fact that he run up to him, that he was eager. And we see, he asked this question, how may I inherit eternal life? Now, I look at this man, and I see he was wanting uh, that approval that we oftentimes want. You know, we want to be told we're doing good. We want to be told we're living right. We want to be told that we do things the right way. You know, my kids, when they don't show me the papers that they failed. They'll show me the papers they made 100 on. We might find the bad grades in their drawer tucked away to where we don't see them. And, and so, you know, we are constantly like that. We are constantly looking for approval. We want the approval of our lives, what we believe, how we act. And that's what this man was looking for. You know, I'll be honest, you know, I, I do it too. You know, and that's one of my downfalls, I think, uh, is, you know, wanting to say the right thing, wanting to be heard, wanting to, for people to pay attention. And, you know, I, as I was at POS this week, and, and I received some of those moments, and a, a pastor that was there come up to me on the last day. Uh, he preached one day during chapel. We have service every day, and I, done, I was the liturgist for him, and now... We don't 
get into all that here much, but the liturgist is the one that reads the scriptures, reads the call to worship, and liturgy is worship. Uh, it's called worship of the people. That's what it means, that the people are doing it. But I was the liturgist for him, so I read the stuff for him, and he, he, uh, he had spent some time with me in, in some of the classes and stuff, and he told me on the last day, he said, uh, he said I just want to tell you, he said, I'm glad there's people like you in Paz. Now, I guess that wouldn't mean so much a lot of the times, but when you compare to some things we see there, and I've talked about it before, uh, some of the leanings of some of the people, their, their view of the Bible, and, and so that was affirmation for me. Not that I was seeking it, but it felt good. You know, you like to hear those kind of things. And, and I think that's what this guy was going for. He had thought he lived a good life, and he ran up to Jesus, fell to his knees, and he expected a certain answer. He expected to be told when he asked if, how could he receive eternal life. He was expecting Jesus to say, you got it. You know, you ain't got to do nothing else. From this day forth, you have eternal life because you've been good. That's what he was expecting. You know, he, he asked, and Jesus asked me, he said, what about the commandments? Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor their father and mother. He said, hey, I've done all these since I was a little kid, from my youth. Now, look, knowing the heart of man and the nature of people, he just told a lie. Because, you know, we can't do that. We can't be perfect in that way. Um, and so... You know, but he thought that, and Jesus didn't address it because he was going to address it another way. Jesus told him, and we have to look at when, when Jesus beheld him and looked at him, he had mentioned all these commandments, and he told him, he said, look, do you do this? He said, yeah, no problem. So you can imagine his confidence is getting up now. He's fixing to tell me I've got eternal life. You know, this is that approval I've been wanting. I've heard of this great teacher because he didn't address him as God. He didn't address him as the Son of God. He addressed him as teacher. He said, Master, teacher. And when he addressed him as that, you know, he's like, this teacher, this great teacher is going to approve me. You know, he's going to affirm what I've been doing is right and good and perfect and righteous. But Jesus, in loving him, said, no. He said, there's one thing. One thing. And as we look at that and we look at our lives, you know, I think we all, I know we all, have at least one thing that keeps us from following God like we need to. We all have one thing that's in our life that don't need to be there. Or it's an attitude that don't need to be there. We all have one thing. And this morning I want to look at what is that one thing. You know, he took... Jesus tells this rich young ruler, he said, You've got, you lack one thing. Go your way and sell whatever you have and give it to the poor. You know, that was the one thing. Now, we look at the verse, it seems like to me that's an awful lot more than one thing. You know, sell your stuff, then give, all the way the mo give away all the money, and then take up this cross. I don't know what you're talking about there because this is before the cross. He didn't have a clue what he was talking about. He said, take up the cross and follow me. And so, you know, that tells me that's more than one thing. But when you get back to the root of it, and, and he tells him to sell his possessions. You know, this was a man who had control, he had possessions, he had power, he had authority. And all Jesus wanted him to do was give that up. He said, when you give that up, you submit to me. You know, he could have sold all of his stuff, but that wouldn't have been enough because he would have still had the money. And we know that the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. He would have still had that. In essence, he would have still had his stuff. He'd have had the money from it. He wouldn't have gave it up. And so then he said, give it all to the poor. You know, and what he was saying, and, and this ain't saying, you know, we have to give everything we have to the poor, but we can't be so attached to it that we won't. We can't be so attached to it that, that we give up eternal life. I mean, this is eternal life that we was he was talking about here, and he would not give it up because he thought that much of it. You know, so what are those things in our life that we hold on to that we don't give up to keep from following God? You know, we may, we may do that stuff. We may give away all we have, and we may uh, submit that stuff to God that we don't have control over it ourselves, 
but then we don't take up our cross. And, you know, and when you take up the cross, this is not something that's forced on us. Uh, you know, you may hear people say that some sickness they have, say, well, it's the cross I bear. That's not, that's not what that is. Because a cross you bear in that sense is something that's forced on you. You know, somebody with bad eyesight that didn't do nothing to deserve bad eyesight, they'll say, well, that's the cross I bear. That, that was forced on them. They had no power in that. But when Jesus says, take up that cross, that means you make the choice. You decide that you do not want anything else to interfere with your relationship with God, and you take up that cross and you follow Him. And, and that's not a popular thing. You know, as I was telling the teenagers today, look, your view of the Bible needs to be different. Your view of God needs to be different. You know, there's a lot of people, they disregard the Bible. You know, I've just spent 10 days with a bunch of people that do. You know, and so we have to be different than everybody else. There ain't a, every Christian out there ain't carrying the cross. Every Christian out there ain't submitting to the gospel of Jesus Christ. They, every person out there is not... Uh, devoting their whole life fully to him. They're not following him. You know, and we see many things in our life and, you know, there may be sin in our lives that we just hold on to. That we put the indulgences of that sin above our relationship with God. Or it may be an attitude that we put our attitude, our preconceived notions about uh, above growing in Christ. You know, and it may be uh, and going to that, you know, are quenching the Holy Spirit. You know, we, we are more concerned with staying with the status quo than following God. You know, when we feel the Holy Spirit moving in a certain way, we resist it. You know, I, I heard a saying a while back, and I, and I think it's true. And follow me on this. It said, if the Holy Spirit died tomorrow. Now, we know the Holy Spirit can't die. He's God. But let's just say, if the Holy Spirit died tomorrow, a lot of your churches will still meet the next Sunday and not know the difference. I mean, you, you think about that. And, and that's, that's the status, uh, that's one of the one things that we let hold us back. You know, we see the examples of the seven churches in Revelation. You know, Jesus said to several of them, I have this one thing against you. You know, he started with the church at Ephesus. He said, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. That was their one thing. It held them back. He said, You do good in this, you do good in this, but I've got one thing against you. You've left your first love. You know, he goes on, he talks to the church at Pergamos. Now, he had more than one thing against them. He had a, I have a few things against thee. Because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of God. And then the church at Thyatira, he says, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, who calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. He goes on to the church at Sardis. It says, Remember therefore thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore shall not watch, I will come on thee as a thief. He was worried about them not watching, not paying attention, not being ready. He goes on and says, Thou have a few names there in Sardis that have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So he's saying, Look, there's a few people there that are following me. Some of you others are not. The church at Laodicea, he said, I know your works, thou art neither cold nor hot. Because you say, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. You know, that rich young ruler was the same way. He had possessions, he was rich, so he didn't need nothing else. I mean, he, you think about it. He said, I've got all this, I don't need the eternal life that Jesus can give me. Because if he had, if he really thought he needed it, if he really thought he believed in it that much, he would have given it up. You know, as we look at this passage and we try to 
survey our lives. We look, what is the one thing that keeps us from following God? You know, and, and that's, that's individually, that's as a church. Because look, Christianity is a fellowship. That's what it's based on. Now, you have individual salvation, but that individual salvation is not supposed to stay individual. We're supposed to fellowship with others. This is a fellowship. Our Christian walk relates to other people's Christian walk. And so we have to, to stick together in this. You know, we have, that's why we've got to be of one mind. You know, Paul preached about that a lot, being of one mind and one accord. We have to have the same mind, the same goals, the same purposes. And we look at the Great Commission, that is our purpose. And that is to uh, go out into the world to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And, you know, there are things that keep us from doing that. You know, and, and, and submitting to that. You know, that, as corporately as a church, individually, we have it in our lives. You know, we look at, you know, David at a point in his life had one thing against him. And that was the sin with Bathsheba. You know, Solomon at one point in his life well, I say one thing, but it was a numerous amount of things and all his wives and concubines that he had let worship other gods that has made him go astray. You know, we see uh, Ananias and Sapphira in the New Testament. They had one thing. They kept them from following God. They sold that property and then lied about what they got for it and didn't give it to the church. You know, we have these one things in our life. You know, at one time, Peter had one thing that kept him from being what he needed to be. And so, you know, we look at our lives, we, we kind of survey them a little bit, and I, I think we don't do that enough. We don't survey our lives and see where we stand with God. And, you know, Jesus said, take up my cross and follow me. Do we know what that means? You know, as, as we go throughout our every day and you know I say it a lot it could be time that we just don't devote to God that we don't commit fully you know we're we have other things that take higher priority and and it's sad you know and, and you know I don't want to beat up on Christians as a whole but it's the truth that minister that said to me that told me what I told you when looking at the denomination, he said, Grassroots Cumberland Presbyterians love Jesus. You know, as people on this level. He said, those other guys up top, I don't know. But we have to make sure that we don't let anything get in the way of us picking up our cross and following Jesus. You know, that we have to make sure that, that we let everything else go. You know, when we hear this, the song, I have decided to follow Jesus, you know, do we live that? You know, though none go with me, I still will follow. You know, because when we look at, we, let, we may let one thing or a few things keep us from following Jesus, but when we look at the gospel, when we look at God, God had one thing. He had his son, Jesus Christ, and he didn't, he didn't hold on to it. He, he didn't... He didn't uh, keep him from us. He gave his one thing, his only begotten, to die for us. And, and in that, he gave us the Holy Spirit to, to counsel us, to convict us, to move us. And in that, and you look in the book of Ephesians and how the grace that we've received is exceedingly abundant. You know, because we may have this one thing in our life, but God gave his one thing for us. And if we can't recognize that, we have other issues. You know, the church is to be God's presence here on earth. And so as we look at, are we that presence? You know, do we teach? Do we, do we preach? Do we disciple? Do we minister to people? And what keeps us from doing it? I mean, I, we can't do it 100% of the time, 24 hours a day, I know. But there's many things, many things that we can do that we don't because we let one or few things get in our way. So as Cleet and Cheryl come up for the invitation, you know, as you look at this passage, kind of compare it to your life. Is there one thing that if Jesus came in here today and said, there's one thing I have against you, what would it be?
Can, can you survey and kind of pick that out? You know, it, look at it this way. You look at the seven letters to the churches. If he come in, what would he write to our church? You know, how would that sound? You know, what would that say? And if he come in and talk to you individually, what would he say? Have you been following me, or is there one thing that I still have against you? Let us stand and sing. Turn it through 10. You just paid it off.